Hello everyone and welcome to another casual review. Today I'm talking about Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon. This is the third and final Spyro game of the original Spyro saga. And I did play this through the Spyro Reignited games. For this game's story, Spyro and his buddy Hunter and all of the dragons are chilling back in the dragon shores. So we have moved away from the land of Avalar in the second game. What I find is interesting is uh, inexplicably there's not really any presence of the professor or the love interest Elora until the very end of the game and I suspect that they were omitted from most of the game to introduce new character a bunny sorceress named Bianca so at the very beginning of the game Bianca steals all of the dragon eggs and then hops down a tunnel and apparently this tunnel takes us to the other end of the Dragon Shores world. We're still in the same world as the first Spyro game, but it's like a parallel to that. So just like in the first Spyro game, we are back to rescuing dragon eggs. However, instead of only, I think it was 12 in the first game, you are trying to rescue 150 of these little babies. So they kind of take the role of the dragon statues in the first one. I found the dragon statues to be the most entertaining because each of the dragon was so different and had such unique things to say. I do like the dragon eggs compared to the power orbs in the second Spyro. Basically, whenever you do find a dragon egg, a little baby dragon hops out. They do something little silly kind of thing, like they'll try to fly up and then plop down to the ground, or they'll do a little cartwheel or something like that. By the end of the game, I was just skipping these animations because I did find that most of the animations would cycle, and I've already seen a lot of them. But these are one of the resources that you're chasing after if you're going for a complete completionist run like I did. The other being, of course, uh, treasure. There is plenty of treasure for you to collect, and the fan favorite bear money bags is back as well to charge you an arm and a leg in order to progress to new areas as well. You keep all of the abilities that you previously purchased from him in the second Spyro. However, there are some new features in this game, mostly in the form of new friends that you rescue. Basically, uh, the evil sorcerer, the one that Bianca works for, trapped these creatures and kept money bags in charge of protecting them. And so you have to pay money bags in order to release these creatures. And then these creatures now become playable characters. And so there are segments in this game where you might get to play as a kangaroo or a flying bird with artillery or a monkey with a gun. While it is called Spyro the Dragon and so you expect to be playing as a dragon the entire time, you still play as Spyro most of the time, but I do like these introductions of these new animal friends because they do kind of mix up the gameplay. They do like to play around with different genres, so sometimes you'll be playing as this monkey with a space gun and it's kind of playing more as like a, a first person shooter kind of game. There are other segments where you even get to play as Sparks, the dragonfly that accompanies Spyro. That's kind of an indication of his health meter and it kind of plays like a, a top down shooter, almost similar to something like the old gauntlet games where they have these like uh, these little buildings that will continuously spawn insects unless you destroy the buildings. I actually really like the sparks levels in particular. What's weird about the sparks levels is they don't get unlocked until you beat the boss of that overworld and so it's kind of one of those things that I just ended up going back and doing at the very end of the game rather than throughout and it's weird that it kind of like gated that off. There's even like a, a segment where you're playing as the kangaroo that I mentioned earlier and that one kind of plays like a, a 2D platformer at some times, but she can like jump super high. Uh, you get to play as like a Yeti who has just like a huge club and it feels super strong as well. You know, I actually kind of think that they should have implemented these friends, these playable friends a little more because you maybe get like two or three times when you get to play as each one. Now, the frustrating thing about these animal friends is if you're going for a 100% completionist run and you haven't purchase these friends, quote unquote, from money bags, then if you go to certain levels that require you to have these guys unlocked, you will have to return to the level, similar to in Spyro 2 where you had to like purchase the ability in order to complete it. This is just a, a little inconvenience for me anyway, because I, I just hate having to like return back to a level that I already played through because I wasn't able to complete it the first run around. They did bring back a couple other features from the first Spyro. Uh, the 
enemies, they drop treasure again, so you don't really have that other incentive to defeat enemies in order to unlock like a powerful gate that gives you a temporary power up. Uh, in this game, you are required to defeat all the enemies if you're trying to get all of the treasure. They do still have these like power up gates, but it's not as consistent as it was in the second Spyro game. Since the baby dragon eggs are back again as well, uh, there's more implementation of these blue thieves that will go nah, 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 then they kind of run away and you have to chase them down. I found that they made it a little easier than it was in the second game. The flying levels are back as well and they, I feel like they've ramped up the difficulty on these flying levels again. I didn't have too much trouble with them in the second one. In this game, uh, you actually talk, talk to Sparks every time you go to one of these speedway flying levels and he'll kind of buzz at you. And there are two different game modes for these levels now as well. One is like the traditional, you gotta burn down all the enemies and fly through all the hoops within the time limit. And the second one kind of plays more like a race and the races in particular gave me a tough time because basically you start in like the last place and you have to fly your way through the, the first place while flying through all these rings. But you also find like different power-ups like a little missile that you can shoot at the enemy in front of you and stuff. It, these took a while and since they take so much time to try and complete, it was always frustrating. You spend like a good three or four minutes trying to get to first place. You end up being in second place and then you have to like start the whole thing over again. So they took up a good chunk of my time. Oh, and in addition to this, in these flying levels, you also have to find Hunter and Hunter has his own little mini game. Usually Hunter has his gadgets that he builds and you have to like chase down UFOs or something like that. This is pretty similar to how it was in Spyro 2 as well. There is a centralized type of enemy in this game. Unlike Spyro 2, where each world has its own enemies, um, it's a little more like Spyro 1, where it's just like a bunch of norks, but instead of norks, the baddies in this game are called Rhinox, and Rhinox are led by the evil sorcerer, not Bianca, the one that Bianca works for. And so you, oftentimes in these worlds, they'll be themed like different period pieces, like sometimes one level you'll go to like a, a Rome, an ancient Rome type of world, and the Rhinox will be dressed up kind of like gladiators. There's not really like any intro and outro cutscenes when you enter these different worlds. I, I feel like most of the cutscene budget was spent on the centralized story, which I actually like that there's actually a, a minor plot that kind of develops with Bianca. We can tell pretty early on that Bianca is having doubts about the sorcerer that she works for, and we can tell there's a, a budding romance between her and Hunter, and so I feel like I enjoyed these cutscenes more than just the little blurbs introducing each level. And I do like Bianca as a character. You know, I did play through this trilogy one time before, the Reignited trilogy, that is, and I didn't remember this, but I guess I never finished the third Spyro. I guess I got burnt out because I did notice um, after, you know, one or two hours into Spyro 3, the achievements started popping up again, and there's a lot of stuff that I didn't actually remember. Like, I remember that you have a mini game where you skateboard as Spyro and you like go up half pipes and do tricks and stuff like that. Um, but that was like my main takeaway from Spyro 3 the last time I played it. And so I actually finally did play through all of the third Spyro. And yeah, I, I am getting maybe a little burnt out from the, the Spyro trilogy because that's a, a lot of Spyro. You know, with this reignited trilogy, you actually are getting a big bang for your buck. I feel like I've seen this trilogy maybe for under $20 depending on what system you get it for. And so you're, if you like Spyro, you're gonna get a lot of Spyro game time here, especially if you did what I did and you 100% completed all three of the games. What's really weird is the, com the actual completion percentage of these three games. To actually 100% complete the first Spyro game, uh, it says 120%. The second game will just say 100%. And if you're 100% completing the third game, it says 117%. I feel like the the third game definitely has the best reward for uh, completing the game. In this game, uh, at the very end, you do get to beat up money bags. You get to chase them down and you just see all of the gems that you paid him return to you. Uh, it's a lot more entertaining than how they did it in the second one where your friends just force him to pay you back. And then you go to a super secret world where they are just dumping treasure on you. It's really satisfying just seeing those numbers rapidly go up as, they, as you defeat an enemy 
enemy or destroy a box or something like that. And so the, the final level was very rewarding, unlike the first two games where, I, I don't know, I feel like the second game was kind of a weird reward with the whole carnival kind of thing. And then the first game just gave you access to an additional flying kind of puzzle level. And so this was definitely the best reward. I definitely liked this game better than the second Spyro Ripto's Rage. I can't tell if I liked it better than the first one or not. Um, it's kind of hard to tell because like I said, I was feeling a little bit of Spyro fatigue. So my gut instinct is to give this game a three out of five. But as I'm talking about it, I may bump that up to a four out of five because I actually did have a fun time with all the different ways that they mix up the gameplay in terms of like the friend companions and stuff like that. You know, I, I actually think that I will bump this up to a four out of five. I liked it about as much as the first Spyro, I want to say. I know I was complaining about it in the second Spyro where they kind of like lost the fantasy magic type of setting, but uh, the gameplay here was actually pretty surprisingly good. Well guys, that's it for me. Let me know if you have any questions or comments about Spyro 3, Year of the Dragon, or the Spyro Reignited Trilogy, and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. Bye!